I have shared a story before with members of our community that being in the delivery room when our oldest son, Micah, was born brought me face to face with the raw parts of myself. That when my wife Anna was in labor, I vividly remember the swirl of emotions that enveloped me. I wanted, of course, to be the strong husband, and the delivery room was a, a crucible of my deepest fears and greatest hopes where they collided. And I found myself in a, in a space of intense vulnerability, not as vulnerable as Anna, of course, but uh, intense vulnerability for me in this moment. Surrounded by strangers and medical personnel, I was acutely aware of the high stakes, the hope for a healthy baby and the fear of something going terribly wrong with Anna and our child were ever present. This tension was a potent reminder of what it means to be human, to love deeply and to face the fear that we could lose everything in an instant. H.P. Lovecraft once said that the oldest and strongest emotion of mankind is fear. And the oldest and strongest kind of fear is the fear of the unknown. This resonated deeply with me as I stood there trying to, of course, stay as grounded as I possibly could. And it reminded me of the universal truth that fear is an inevitable part of our human journey. We live, of course in challenging times of political instability, of social divisions and rising violence that are pervasive and frightening, as we've seen. The attempted assassination of a former president and current presidential candidate highlights our fragile election cycle and the deep national divisions that we have. According to recent research, Americans fear let our loved ones are going to die, Americans fear becoming seriously ill, of not having enough money for retirement or mass shootings, losing physical mobility, corrupt officials, chronic diseases, high medical bills, and another world war. Those are just the things that Americans fear right now. And of course, there are concerns for Israel, and there are concerns for Palestine, and Ukraine, and South Sudan, along with global warming and human migration all of which underscore our world's fragility. A friend of mine jokes that the definitive Jewish email subject line reads, start worrying, details to follow. <laughs> from political turmoil to wars, from concerns about America's future to Israel's present, from worries for our parents and to our children, we have received the emails and the emails and the emails and it's a lot. It's fitting that we come to this week's Torah portion, the story of Balak, the king of Moab, from the book of Numbers. Balak was driven by fear of the unknown as the Israelites advanced, and he hired Balaam to curse the Israelites. And this act of desperation speaks to our human tendency to seek control over the uncertainty. Because in our modern world, fear is as pervasive as it could possibly be. Just Google the term fear, and it yields billions of results. Consider the many fears that we all hold on to. And if you're comfortable, I'm going to invite you to raise your hand if you've ever had a fear like this. If you've ever had a fear of failure, raise your hand. A fear of the unknown. A fear of illness. A fear of failing to meet our responsibility. A fear of aging and insecurity. A fear of being judged. A fear of death. I'm not sure you saw what I saw, but a lot of you were raising your hands. We all have fears just like Balak. It's part of being human. Now, this past year, a bat mitzvah student, Charlotte Holtzman, taught me about a famous rabbi whose work I really hadn't known so well. Of course, I'm speaking of Rabbi Taylor Swift, <laughs> who wrote about her album, Fearless. She said, to me, fearless is not the absence of fear. It's not being completely unafraid. 
To me, fearless is having fears and doubts, lots of them. To me, fearless is living in spite of those things that scare you to death. Fearless is about getting back up and fighting for what you want over and over again, even though every time you've tried before, you've lost. It's fearless to have faith that someday things will change. Rabbi Swift teaches us that the living is about moving forward despite our fears, recognizing that they are a part of our story, not the whole of it. And it reminded me also a little of a story about my older brother, Jeremiah, and about a playful rivalry that he and I had when we were young adults. We often played practical jokes on each other, never, well, hopefully never without harm, but always with uh, amusement. And once, when I was visiting him in California, he greeted me at the airport dressed in a ridiculous clown costume, welcomed me me to the Los Angeles Clown College with a huge sign and balloons. It was hilarious. It was unforgettable in in LAX. So later that year, Jeremiah visited Denver for Passover, and I decided, of course, to return the favor. Armed with balloons and a sign that read, Congratulations, Jeremiah Knight. You finally made parole. (laughs) Now, I waited at the gate in the days where you could go pick someone up at the gate, and his seat was at the very back of the plane. And it ensured that every passenger saw the sign. And as people started to gather, curious, a, a large tattooed man exited the plane and he looked right at me in the sign and he smirked and he walked on and a woman approached me telling me that she had seen the tattooed man when she got on the plane and that she had sat next to him terrified of him and that she was convinced that the sign was for him and her comment it stayed with me more than my brother's laughter when he finally got off because it highlighted how our, our snap judgments, while sometimes protective, can also be so misguided. We often make these assessments to navigate our world, asking ourselves if a situation is safe or if a person poses a threat. And these judgments can be life-saving, but they can also be so limiting. I bring this up because we are all making a lot of snap judgments right now about the fears that we may have about our state of the world. We may see things around us and start to react instantly, creating inferences and fears. And this tendency, while natural, can lead us to misjudge situations and people much like the woman at the airport did. Because in these moments, it's crucial to pause and reflect ensuring our reactions are grounded in reality and not just in our fears. To live is to be afraid. Because endowed with imagination, we have the ability to visualize and anticipate what will happen to our health and our security and our loved ones. Fears help us to act and relate to the dangers in our world with awareness and safety and creativity. But fears, they can also dominate our lives and become paralyzing anxieties. It's all too easy to watch the news and just get more and more anxious. In the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, God comforts us with the words al-tira. Thirty-nine times we are told, al-tira, don't fear. God says all tira to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah. God says all tira, don't fear to our prophets, to Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. It is a timeless message for our people. Al tira, do not fear. But God isn't saying to have no fears. Rather, God is telling us to push through our fears and to keep them in check. Al tira, don't fear, because fears can prevent us from making thoughtful decisions. Al tira, don't fear, because fears can take the form 
of suspicion and mistrust and bring out the worst in us. Al Tirah, don't fear, because whether we are facing the uncertainty of our lives or anti Semitic threats, fear should not be and cannot be our operating value. It's really important to remember the scope of Jewish history. We've lived through obstacles before and we've overcome them. Rabbi Nachman of Bratslav teaches us that the human spirit is strong. Our history has taught us that the whole world is a narrow bridge. And the most important thing is to not be afraid and to move forward undeterred. In Jewish time, the past is the context for our present. And our present actions will set up the stage for future generations. And because of this understanding of our place within the unfolding nature of history, we have an obligation, all tirah, to not act out of fear. Instead, we act with our values. Instead, we act with the transmitted values that we have through the generations. To have courage, omets lev, in the face of fear is a really difficult thing to do, especially by ourselves. Because courage begins when we face our realities and prepare ourselves to meet them head on. But how do we do that? King Balak, isolated and gripped by fear, hired the prophet Balaam to curse the advancing Israelites. Yet in a twist of fate, Balaam blessed them instead. His blessing resounds with a powerful message. Ma tovu ohalecha Yaakov mishkenotecha Yisrael. How good are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel. In this blessing, we uncover the antidote to fear. And it's embedded in our dwelling places, the places where we gather, and the places that we call home. Because we are social beings. We're social beings woven together by the threads of relationships. From the glow of campfires to the warmth of our kitchen tables, it is in the tents and the dwelling places of Israel, our homes and our neighborhoods and synagogues, that we build the relationships that give our lives depth, support, and meaning. We yearn for friends who stand by us for advice and trusted voices. We long to learn and celebrate in the company of others. We seek companions who inspire us to become our best selves. And in exchange of ideas and the sharing of passions, we find nourishment and life. We may not face the pharaohs and the tyrants of yore, but we are indeed absolutely facing many threats and many dangers nonetheless. And many people think that synagogues should be sanctuaries away from all that is divisive and all that is challenging. And I want to suggest a slightly different approach. Yes, our synagogues need to be places of spiritual uplift. And the sacred spaces that we have in synagogues are now one of the only places in society today for serious and impactful conversations and dialogue. I want you to think about what I'm saying. That the fraying of the social fabric in our country has destroyed the public squares and spaces where meaningful and important dialogue once happened. And that houses of faith like ours are now one of the few sacred spaces where we can come together to face our fears, to share our unique perspectives, and to support one another. Synagogues, abate Knesset, houses of gathering, provide us with the unique spaces that we were blessed with thousands of years ago, sacred spaces where we can listen to each other's stories, share our struggles, and celebrate our triumphs. Sacred spaces where we can build deep connections that strengthen our community and help us to navigate the challenges of modern life. Spaces where we can disagree with each other respectfully and still go eat a bagel together afterwards. If not here, then where? And if not now, then when? 
And listening is our first step. Like the woman at the airport who saw the man with the tattoos, we shouldn't assume to know what is going on in the lives or minds of the people in our own community. We shouldn't assume to know what is central and important to each other's lives. Each member of our congregation has desires and interests. Each member of our community is facing the dynamics of a modern society in similar and also in different ways. And each person has different perspectives based on their own life stories. But what I also know is that each of us is a central element of the compassionate and kind living faith that we can build together. Being a part of a community involves more than paying membership dues. Temple Bethel, sorry, I know the president is sitting in the back, I probably shouldn't say that, but it's true. Being part of a community is more than paying our My Temple commitment. Because Temple Bethel needs to be a place that motivates us to live meaningful and impactful Jewish lives in relationship with one another, in support of one another, and in knowing one another. The rabbis of the Mishnah tell a parable. When the people stamp coins from a seal, the coins all look the same. Yet every human being is descended from a common ancestor from Adam, and no two of us are alike. God wants us to be exactly who we are, bringing unique and distinct gifts, abilities that can add tremendously to our community. As we continue to build a relevant and vibrant Judaism that will live on for generations to come, it is in the social halls and sanctuaries of Temple Bethel where we need to weave the social fabric of shared belonging shaped by the idea that when we are in relationship and well-connected, we can better care for and the well-being of one another. And when we can respect each other because of our differences, we can support the spiritual growth and the learning of one another to live fuller lives. May we choose, as our ancient ancestors did, to value possibility and relationship over self-interest. May we share the gifts of ourselves with others. May we openly receive the gifts of others into our own lives. Altira, don't just fear because of what we are seeing. Fear wisely. Have courage to face our realities head on. Act with the best of our values. Because as Jews, we know the scope of history. We have faced tough times before, and we will face them again. We will travel the road ahead with courage. We will travel the road ahead together, illuminating a path forward with the values that have guided us over millennia. Amen.